Have you ever received an award in life, whether it was in school or perhaps your, your workplace or some community or civic organization that recognized your hard work and they wanted to award you for that? And they were grateful for the work that you put in and that you showed maturity and responsibility for whatever that reward was. You know, the highest honor that we can receive or a reward that we receive from God is that he calls us one of his children. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is 1 John 3 and verse 1, which says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called children, or perhaps your version says the sons of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. One way that we show that we are God's children is to have Christ-like attitudes. In Philippians 2.5, the Bible tells us that we are to have the mind of Christ. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. In Romans chapter 12, Paul identifies several attitudes that will identify us as mature children of God. And so as we continue in our study this week of the Christian's attitude, we want to know what it takes for us as God's children to have an attitude of a mature child of God. And so we're going to continue looking at our study, as we mentioned last week, and our study is going to be taken from the book by Brother Mike Winkler called Attitudes, the Heart of a Child of God. And it's certainly a wonderful study. It's a, a short, compact study, again, that we mentioned last week, but I think one that helps us to understand and know that we have a specific attitude with which we should display, not only to the world, but also to those around us and also to ourselves. And that's what we want to open up with and discuss today. Let's start with a word of prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, we are grateful unto thee for this day and for the blessing of it. We thank you for loving us in so many ways. We thank you for being there for us and watching over us. We certainly thank you for another day of life in which we're able to shine our lights for your Son who so um, wonderfully presented us with that gift of his life as he died on the cross of Calvary for us. Father, we pray now as we go through this study that you will be with us and watch over us, that we have the right attitudes, that we have an open heart and an open mind to do those things you would have us do, but also that we reflect the attitude of what it means to be a child of God and the blessings that come from that. Father, help us to always shine our lights, and we know the devil is always walking about looking to dis, you know, extinguish that light and to put it out, but Father, help us to prevail and to, to show the world really what it means to walk with you and to be a child of God. Father, we thank you for our church family. We are certainly grateful for all of those who are present today and watching online for this Bible study. We pray that you'll bless them. Grateful for our visitors who are watching with us, and we pray that you'll also bless those as well. We pray that you'll continue to bless our elders and our deacons and watch over them, Father, and bless all of us collectively as your body here at Cary, Father, as we strive to do your will, as we push forward to getting back to normal, Father, as we continue to um, to encourage one another and to lift each other up. And we're so grateful that we continue to see the numbers on the decline now, Father, with the COVID virus. And we pray that will continue to be the case that will enable us to be back as you would have us to be here at the Cary Church of Christ. Father, we thank you so much for this nation in which we live, the freedoms that we enjoy. Help us to never take that for granted, but also to understand that our first and foremost responsibility is to you. Help us to always show the world who you are and what Jesus means to us. Father, we continue to pray and lift up those before you in our congregation who are hurting and who are suffering and uh, who are suffering with illnesses, those who have suffered with the virus, and certainly we pray for those who are grieving over the loss of loved ones, especially those who have lost loved ones due to COVID. And we pray for our country and those who have lost loved ones because of COVID. Father, we know many people are hurting right now and they need you and we know you're ever present and we, we pray that we can do something that might encourage them to reach out to you and understand the grace and the love and the comfort and peace that you provide for them. Father, help us to always put you first and foremost in our lives. Thank you for walking with us. We pray you continue to watch over those standing on foreign shores who are providing us with that blanket of freedom we take for granted. Protect our military, protect our first responders. Father, watch over all of those who are um, out there um, providing us with those things necessary to continue our day-to-day -day life, and we're grateful for their sacrifices. Father, we thank you so much for loving us. We thank you for calling us your children. And again, most of all, we thank you for Jesus. In his name we do humbly pray. Amen. So as we think about what our attitude should be, especially the heart of what a, of, of God's child should be, last week we talked about what it means to be, to be happy. And certainly that also is, is in relation to what it means to be content. And we looked at 
the Beatitudes, the eight specific Beatitudes that we read about in Matthew chapter 5, to be meek and to be peacemakers and those that seek and, and want to follow after righteousness. Those things that we follow after help us to develop an attitude in, as God's children of what it means to be happy. But today we want to talk about how we mature as a child of God. The Bible instructs us in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 9, that we're to continue to grow, that we add those Christian graces. That's the concept of what it means to mature. Maturity is learning from the things in which we've had previously or that we've experienced previously and putting those practical things to use that help us to mature. And that comes from knowledge and also from learning from individuals and watching. So how do we as God's children develop a proper attitude towards what it means to grow in maturity? Well, the first thing we have to, to understand is as we look at Romans chapter 12, and we want to unpack the, the first several verses here today, is that the child of God's attitude towards our body should be extremely important. And so as we look at Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, as Paul opens this chapter up for us, he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. So when we think about maturity, we think about our bodies, and I don't mean in relation to growing old. As we mature, we think about growing old and getting more gray hair as I can see in my beard or in my hair. What does it mean to care for our physical bodies as a child of God in, in relation to our maturing? Well, caring for our physical bodies is really a matter of stewardship. The Bible, or rather, the dictionary defines the word stewardship as conducting, supervising, or managing something, especially the careful and responsible management of something entrusted to one's care. And when we think about our physical bodies, certainly this is what God has given to us to, to be stewards over, to watch after, right? Hence, as stewards of our physical bodies, we are to we are admonished to present them to God as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. Just as Christ was presented as a lamb without spot, spot or blemish, he was presented as a sacrifice to God. Therefore, when we come before God, we are to be a living sacrifice, presenting ourselves in an acceptable manner towards God. That shows maturity that we know how important that is. So we know that we must care for our bodies by practicing the grace of self-control. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 6, 12, All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. So Paul talks about this idea of what it means to control oneself. We must, all, we must also care for our bodies so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in them. So we want to make sure that we're controlling ourselves, not to allow those things of the world to take control of us, but with that, the same idea is then brought into subjection as Paul is talking about concerning the mind and the body is that we're presenting our body so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in them. Again, this goes to shining our light to the world. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 10, always caring about in the body the dying of the Lord, or excuse me, always caring about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. And so there's a challenge for caring for our physical bodies that we might present them that Christ is manifested in ourselves, that in that we're glorifying God in all of those things that we do. Paul also encourages us in Ephesians chapter 5, to ch he challenges us to love our bodies by cherishing them and nurturing them. So Paul writes, so husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. Again, we present our bodies a living sacrifice before God, so therefore we must take care of ourselves so that we might be productive. And, and we'll look at what it means to, to establish and use the talents that God has given us. But we want to be healthy and productive as long as we can while we're here on this short stay of what we call earth before we finally get to be with God in eternity. And so again, we are to present our bodies as a living, a working sacrifice. We must remember that our bodies are for the Lord's work and for His glory. Think about 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 13. Paul says, "Food, Foods for the stomach and the stomach for foods, but God will destroy both 
both it and them, and now the body is not for sexual morality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Again, he carries this idea over into Colossians 3.23. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. So our bodies are members of Christ, and we present them in such a way that as we present our bodies, it's doing so that we might bring glory to God. And so Paul records in 1 Corinthians 6.15, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? That is, we belong to God. Shall it then take the members of Christ and, and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. And so when we think about what we must do with our bodies and presenting it in such a way that we take care of ourselves, that we're glorifying God. But let me say this. Presenting our bodies is not about an outward appearance, but remember, as, as God was telling Saul there in relation to David, uh, or, or as God was talking about David in relation to who David was going to be and what they were wanting in, in relation to a king, this outward appearance, right? God says, I'm not looking on that. I'm looking on the heart, not on the countenance or the stature or the physical appearance. So when we're presenting our bodies in such a way, it means that internally we're remaining pure and that's what we're presenting to God, right? For as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. It's about the internal aspects of what we're presenting to God. It's about our heart. It's about our humility. It's about our minds, that we're keeping our minds pure. So when you think about keeping ourselves pure and presenting it to God, what should our attitudes then be towards the world? As God's children, how do we view the world? Because it's really important. Paul writes in Romans 12 and verse 2, as we continue looking at Romans chapter 12, Paul says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And so the word translated world here is used to describe a specific age of time. And so what should our attitude be towards the world in which we live, this time in which we live today? We're not concerned with 50 years ago. We're not concerned with 2,000 years ago. We're not concerned with 100 years if God so blesses us with that into the future. We're concerned with where we're living at this moment in this present time. Paul tells us not to be conformed to this present time. The, the author of the book in which we're studying notes that the word conform means to be fashioned or to be shaped like a mold. So we're not to allow ourselves to be fashioned or molded into the way in which this specific time and age wants us to be, right? The world is constantly telling us, and that's the influence of Satan, certainly. The world is constantly telling us how we should look, how we should dress, how we should act. Do it all for your own glory, not for anybody else's. Be selfish. Be self-centered. It's all about you, right? Get, get what's good for you at this time. Paul says that's not the way we should live. Paul writes in Galatians 4, But now after you have known God, or rather are known by God, he's writing to Christians, how is it that you turn again to the weak and the beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? Why would you want to allow the world concerning sin to put you into bondage that therefore that sin is now your master? So how do we keep then from being conformed to the world? Well, Paul challenges us not to be, to, 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 to be transformed, to think differently. Again, going back to Philippians 2 and verse 5. And again, the author translates the word transform, which means to undergo a change. This happens by renewing our minds. This happens by thinking differently. Renewing means to make something new again. The word mind translates from the word in which describes our perceptions, and perceptions are influenced by our wills and our emotions and our judgments. Paul says, if then we are raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, right? Where, where Christ is sitting on the right hand of God, set your minds on things above, not on things on this earth. Again, the word mind translates from the word in which describes our perceptions, and perceptions are what influence our will, our emotions, our judgments, the way in which we view the world today. And so Paul is saying, you must view the world from a heavenly perspective. That is, how would God view the world? Obviously, it's evil, it's corrupt. The devil's walking about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And so we transform our minds by putting off the old self and putting on the new. So if we're going to put something off, then we must put something on new. But Paul says that you put off concerning your former conduct, the way in which you used to live your life. The old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust 
and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you may put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. So to put on something new, what then must we put on? We can go through many verses in the Bible, but just to name a few important ones that we should be considering, the Bible tells us that we should first put on love, Colossians 3.14, because we are God's children and God is love, 1 John 4, eight. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. That's a righteous love. We're to have the peace of Jesus rule in our hearts, Colossians 3 and verse 15. We're to let the word of Jesus Christ dwell in us richly, Colossians 3.16. Let everything we do in word or deed to be in the name of Jesus Christ, Colossians 3.17. And always remember who we are serving in this life. That's the attitudes the things that we are to put on as new clothing as God's Christians. So we're shaking off the old attitudes, right? We're removing the dirty rags of sin that we used to carry around and the attitudes and the way in which we used to behave. God says you're not that person anymore. And so when we look at the attitudes concerning ourselves, what should that attitude be? How should we view ourselves? You know, we look in the mirror every day and You know, we see more wrinkles, we see aging, you know, maybe we see a transformation because we've been dieting and exercising, whatever the case is, but how do we really view ourselves? Are we happy with ourselves? Again, let's remove the physical concept and let's look at the spiritual and the internal. How do we view ourselves as God's children? Paul writes, as we continue in Romans 12, in verse 3, For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one of you a measure of faith. The Bible encourages us to love ourselves. It's it's not being self-centered or self-righteous to say, well, I love myself. You know, you kind of hear that, that, that old counseling cliche, do you love yourself? That's not what I'm talking about. The Bible encourages us to love ourselves because when we love ourselves from the perspective of being a child of God, it helps us to love other people. I mean, the Bible tells us we should love ourselves. Look at Mark 12 and verse 31. And the second like it is this. You shall love your neighbor, what? As yourself. There's no commandment greater than these. And so we're encouraged to think soberly about ourselves, not to think highly as Paul says In Romans 12 and verse 3, right? To everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Not to have a haughty spirit or a haughty attitude. Soberly, as Paul says, translates uh, to sound judgment uh, or to have this kind of humble estimate of oneself. We are to possess godly humility. Again, going back to what we talked about last week in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 3. So how can we fulfill this responsibility to ourselves. How do do we go about doing that? Well, we're to have a proper concept and understanding of ourselves. We understand that we all need God's grace, right? Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. So we've got to develop this deep love for ourselves, for we cannot love others if we do not love ourselves. And we learn to love ourselves by the way in which God says we should think about ourselves. And so we must develop a love for ourselves if we truly want to help and love other people. We cannot fulfill the responsibility to ourselves if we don't practice self-control or if we don't have a a, a meekness and a humility about us to submit ourselves to God. If, If we're striving to be selfish rather than selfless, it's hard for us to to fulfill the responsibility to ourselves and love ourselves. We must be constantly and diligently working to develop the grace of humility. And again, we discussed that last last week. So what's the attitude of a child of God towards then his brethren? And so we know we must love ourselves. We must portray this attitude of maturity and saying, you know what? I'm content and I'm happy. You know, I, I might not have everything that I want and desire on this physical earth, but I'm content and I'm happy because I'm a child of God. And God has truly blessed me because I'm allowed to be called a child of God. What greater love God has bestowed upon us that we should be called one of his children. Something for which I thank God every time I pray. Thank you for allowing us to be called your child. And so we 
can fulfill that responsibility to ourselves by practicing self-control and submitting ourselves. But what about when it comes to our brethren? How do we view our brethren? You see, we must love our Christian brethren. John writes in John 13, 34 through 35, A new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. What if you have love one for another? Brethren, that's not 100%. Though it should be in the church, it's not because of the way in which sometimes we tend to treat each other. The Bible tells us we've got to be hospitable towards our Christian brethren, to opening up our homes. And Now, I know it's difficult right now because of COVID, but COVID's not going to be around forever, so that can't always be an excuse. It's going away. And so now we've got to project the goal of what we look forward to and get ready to be back in an active Christian service. And so we've got to be hospitable. We've got to love each other, right? Paul says in Romans 12 and verse 13, what? Distributing to the needs of the saints given to hospitality. Our hearts and our homes should always be open Hospitality means to entertain, or more importantly, it means to be lovers of strangers. But not only must we be lovers of strangers, we must also be what? We must also be empathetic towards our brethren. Well, how do we do that? Our hearts and our homes should always be open, yes, and we must always be hospitable, but to be empathetic towards our brethren means that we rejoice with them when they rejoice, and we weep with them when they weep. Brethren, I can tell you right now, people are hurting, and we need each other more than ever right now. We need to be leaning on each other and reaching out to each other, communicating to each other. We must strive to be of the same mind with our brethren. Look at Romans 12 and verse 16. Paul says, to be of the same mind towards one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humbled. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Well, unity is extremely important, isn't it? Look at Psalm 133 and verse 1. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. We must be united, especially when the church is hurting, especially when the world around us seems to be falling apart at the seams. We must be there looking out for each other. So what's the child of God's attitudes then towards our talents? Paul writes in Romans 12, verses 6 through 8, as we continue, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with all liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Every child of God has a talent. Jesus teaches us that talents are different in number and distributed according to each individual's abilities, Matthew 25, 14, and 15. So responsibility has been defined in the book as the Christian's response to his God-given ability. Let me say that again. Responsibility has been defined as the Christian's response to his God-given ability. The responsibility we have towards our gifts is to use them Listen to this, to bring glory to God. Those who choose to neglect their responsibility will experience the wrath and the rejection of God. Think about Romans eleven twenty two. 22. Behold the goodness and the severity of God. And so when we think about our talents that God has given us, ask yourself this question in renewing ourselves and putting off the old self and in collecting the new clothing that God gives us. What is my purpose and my talent for the body of Christ? What, what am I good at? You know, not everyone is gifted with speaking or leading or being in front of people, but we all have a talent that we can use for the glory of God, whether it's sending cards or calling someone or giving encouragement or maybe we're good with our hands or whatever the case is, the list goes on and on. But we all have a talent concerning our maturity. What's our attitudes towards maturing and being active in the church with which we use our hands to make sure that happens? What about our attitude towards sin? Again, looking at Romans chapter 12, notice what Paul says in verse 9. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. We all know as Christians, sin is defined as lawlessness, right? We cannot, as God's children, be neutral towards sin. Either we choose to obey God 
Well, we don't. I mean, it comes down to that. There's there's no middle ground. There's no gray area. Either we choose to follow God or, or we don't, right? We can't serve two masters. But the problem, I think, many times is that many try to minimize sin. Remember, sin is deceptive, as, as the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews 3.13. It's progressive. It's, it's enslaving. Peter wrote in 2 Peter 2 and verse 19, While they promised them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. And so we've got to make sure that as God's children we're maturing to to not allow ourselves to fall back into that bondage of sin, to be enslaved by it, to be captives of it. But if we're maturing, that means we're growing, and that means we're not allowing those things to affect us because we're mature in our faith. And that's so important for us to remember, to be mature in faith. So what really matters to God is what's on the inside. As the Bible says in 1 Peter 3 and verse 4, the the hidden heart, right? Rather let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of the gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. When we embrace the attitudes that we see here in Romans chapter 12 that Paul is opening up for us, then we will truly be God's mature children. Because if we're not growing and moving forward, then either we're stagnant or falling behind. And if we're stagnant or if we're falling behind, then God will punish us accordingly because we're not growing in the grace and knowledge of the truth in which God tells us to be. To teach and accurately divide, to use those things that make us complete, to grow in the grace that God has given us, to add those Christian graces again that we talked about in the beginning of this class in 2 Peter chapter 1 verses 5 through 9. What are we doing each day to mature and to have the attitudes of a mature child of God? You see, our attitudes reflect to others how we've grown in Christ. So where can we say we're at on that spectrum or that scale of growth in our Christian faith? If it's not where it should be, then we've got some work that we need to do. But it's never too late. We have the opportunity now to continue to grow and to to move forward and to progress. But brethren, we have to make sure that we don't remain stagnant in our growth and in our faith because we will answer to God for it. So where are you at today in your faith and in your growth? Are you standing still or does it feel like your feet are stuck in the mud? Well, what can you do to change that? What, what old clothing of your former self do you need to remove that you're still holding on to? You see, we've got to take everything and remove everything of our former selves and throw it in the trash. And it needs to be burned. We need to remove it and, and put it away from us because we don't want to be that person. And so we've got to make sure that we're growing. So what can we do to grow? You know the answer to that. If there's something holding you back, something amiss in your life, something that you need to fix, please, I encourage you to do so. And, and if you're, you're watching, if you're listening, I encourage you, if you're not a child of God, to take that step and do those things necessary. Well, then the question is, Larry, what do I got to do then? Well, It starts by accepting and understanding that I'm giving a standard by which I must allow myself to follow. And that's God's standard of righteousness. That's his truth that he gives me. Am I willing to follow that then with the truth that he's given me? Am I willing to open up his word and believe what he tells me? If so, then here comes the step of putting off the former self. And it means we've got to repent of our sin, to to cast and put it away. And I hope that you're ready to do that today. It means we we confess with the mouth, as it tells us in Romans chapter 10, 9, and 10, with the mouth confession is made towards or concerning our salvation, that I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And finally, I remove all of that old clothing and baptism where my sins are washed away, and as I'm raised as a new creature, I'm putting on the new clothing that God is providing me. But it means I've got to grow. It means I don't sit and stay stagnant. It means I, I've got to keep moving forward to mature that my attitude might show in the way in which I'm maturing. And, and I certainly hope that you're ready to do that. And if you are, please reach out to us. You can find all of our information at carrycoc.org. And we certainly hope that you will. I pray that the rest of your week is blessed. I pray our attitudes are what they need to be, that we're happy and content as God's children, but that also we're looking towards being a mature child of God in our faith. Take care and God bless.